today on the journey. We have a very special guest with us today. Uh, I listen to a lot of his podcast. He's got a book out called Control, Control to Aggression that I actually have on my bookshelf. Uh, I've sat in several of his classes over the years at these canine seminars, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. We are very blessed to be able to have him on and actually share that knowledge with us. But today we're traveling down to, it's Sanford, right? Sanford, correct. Sanford, North Carolina. North Carolina. Now, even though he got his graduate at UNC, he still went to Virginia Tech. I did. I got a graduate degree from uh, Virginia Tech. I got a master's degree for there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and we're a not master's gonna, degree. <laughs> we're not going to let you live that down. <clears throat> and even though we beat him in basketball this week, that's yeah, for sure. <laughs> Which is unheard of, but it happened. But today we are with Jerry Bradshaw. Uh, Jerry runs Tar Heel Canine. He also has a sport group called PSA. Uh, I'll let him explain all that. But Jerry, we are honored to have you on today. Um, I'm thankful to be able to pick your brain and talk about things that you literally helped me with and you don't even know it because I listen and consume all that information as much as I can. But, uh, tell us a little, tell, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how long you've been, I mean, I know, but how long you've been doing it, what you do and sure. kind of go from there. Well, I uh, appreciate it. Keith. thanks for having me on today. Um, I have, uh, yeah, uh, as you said, I, I run a police dog training facility, um, called Tar Heel Canine. We've been in business since, uh, actually 1996 is when we opened our doors. Um, so it's been, been quite some time. I've been training law enforcement dogs, military dogs, uh, through my business for, for that amount of time. We, uh, started in 2001 with, um, a sport called PSA protection sports association, which mm -hmm. basically is a uh, combination of obedience and protection exercises that, um, progressively get further toward uh, surprise scenarios as you go up in levels from the PSA one through the PSA three, it's become quite the, uh, quite the hit across the United States as well as, uh, internationally. We've got clubs pretty much all over the world now from, um, you know, England, uh, Ireland, we've got some clubs getting ready to get started in Europe in, uh, uh um, mainland Europe and Portugal, uh, Sweden, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, we've got clubs in South Africa, and Australia, and um, uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent as well. So, got play, got, got people playing all over the world. It's a pretty exciting thing. And one of the things that distinguishes PSA from other sports is the uh, the amount of decoy distractions that we have. So, if anybody's familiar with canine sport of any kind or even police dog training, you know the uh, dogs get pretty riled up when they're in the presence of the decoys. Uh, the guys that are going to catch the dogs. And one of the things that we have to really work hard on is uh, working hard on our control of those dogs around those high level distractions. And so that's kind of the name of the game in PSA is working, working the dogs around those high level distractions as we go further up in the obedience hierarchy. I'm, I'm going to change rooms because uh, one of my dogs is scratching. I was great for I'm going to drive me nuts. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to pop around the corner and uh, head in this other room. But anyway, the, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the driving force behind PSA is, uh, is that type of setup where we're dealing with dogs that are in high states of drive and we've got to control them around the things that really are um, their number one uh, attraction. Uh, those being the decoys that uh, they get to bite. And there are going to be times in obedience where we just want them to be controlled around them. Uh, capped around on them, not making noise, quiet, uh, being able to concentrate on other behaviors such as healing and recalls and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, we, you know, the, 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 a lot of what I do going around doing seminars and things like that is sort of uh, working with police departments and sport people on control of their dogs around those high level distractions, being able to get behaviors such as uh, outs and recalls and things of that nature when, uh, when those dogs are highly stimulated. And, um, you know, some of the things that we've talked about in the past have been, uh, to that. Um, you know, those situations um, that might apply to your, your group of listeners. So I'm eager to, to talk about some of that stuff with you. 
Yeah. And I don't know if I called it, but did you tell everybody how long you've been doing this? Oh, uh, 19, uh, 1994, I believe is when we incorporated and I've been doing police dog stuff since about 96. It's been a couple of years just doing only pet training. Uh, so I've, I've been around for a while, um, uh, in, uh, in this, in this space. Yeah. Uh, so close to, to 30 some odd years now. Yeah. I mean, I know that like I said, when we were in Chesterfield a couple, I don't know, last month or October, <clears throat> I mean, you had said that and. Yeah, so I I mean, I guess we'll just start off with, you know, kind of your training philosophy. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in foundation work, and I've picked mm-hmm. that up from numerous people through the law enforcement side. If you have a good, solid foundation, ever, everything else seems to, you know, fall into place, and it makes it a lot easier, and you don't have to start backstepping. Yeah, I think um, for me... And I just came back from California. I was doing a couple of PSA seminars there. And, you know, one of the things that I tried to hit home on with the people that are at my seminars is you have to first start with what I call a framework. So you kind of understand how you're going to communicate the things you want to communicate to the dog. So, for example, what's your framework in obedience training, uh, you know, from, you know, from a dog that's going to, let's say, start with, you know, basic behaviors like sit and down and recall and so forth. How do we, how do we, um, you know, get those behaviors in, sort of ingrained in the dog? And for most of us, you know, especially with obedience behaviors, we're looking at some sort of like lure and reward system where we start by luring the dog into a sit or, you know, with food or something like that, or luring him into a down and, uh, you know, and then putting that, you know, putting that uh, lure onto what we call a reward system. So you know, once the dog starts to really understand the behavior from the luring, we can start getting the behavior, and then after the fact of the behavior occurring, we can reward the dog for performing. So he understands that on that command cue or hand signal cue, whatever it is, or you know, it could be a particular tone like a whistle, or you know, or anything like that. That we, you know, that a dog performs that behavior, and there's a reward waiting for him once he uh, he performs the behavior. Then we also have to talk a little bit about in that framework how we compel that behavior, right? Once the, once the dog is giving us some of those behaviors like sitting down, there are going to be times where he's going to decide, I don't want to do that. And Mm -hmm. so we have to have a way in which we're going to compel that behavior. And usually we start out compelling those behaviors with a, um, a sort of an introduction to what we call negative reinforcement, where we can, um, you know, get that behavior uh, by pushing the dog or pulling the dog somehow into that behavior, either with a leash and a collar. That's usually where it starts. And then sometimes we'll overlay that with an electronic collar, you know, give the dog the idea that, hey, you know, if I say do this behavior and, and he's not going to do it, that there's going to be a way for us to ensure that he gets into that behavior. And we want to make sure that that dog understands what that's all about. We don't want to be correcting dogs for things that where we haven't introduced that correction in some fashion. So the negative reinforcement piece for us is where we start compelling that behavior when the dog decides he's not going to uh, do it just uh, for the expectation of the reward. Uh, And then we, you know, then we have to uh, follow that up by uh, creating a, an aversive, you know, right. Where if I say sit and the dog chooses not to that negative reinforcement, which might be gentle leash pressure um, in the beginning, then turns into an aversive where the dog avoids the aversive by performing the behavior. And, um, and so that might be a leash correction. Let's say it'll snap on the leash in the up direction or for a down, a snap on the leash in the down direction, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, and then finally in my system, you know, in my framework uh, of looking at it, I want to put the behavior on a variable reward system. So we increase the, um, increase the value of performing the behavior to the dog with that variable reward system. So will you um, explain real quick, will you explain that? Like, I understand exactly what you're saying, but will you explain the, what the variable reward system is to the listeners? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, when we're, you know, I, when I try and explain it to, uh, uh, to my, um, my students, one of the things I, I tell them is when, you know, when you're, um, when you're rewarding a particular behavior and that reward is on what we call a one to one fixed ratio of reward, which means every time the behavior occurs, uh, we pay the dog for, for the behavior, right? So we would, 
you know, ask for a sit and the dog sits and we give him a piece of food every time he sits. When he's in the learning phase, that's very useful. It's a, it's a very efficient way to teach a dog that, you know, this cue, um, which results in this particular behavior, putting your butt on the ground is going to result in this reward and it becomes very predictable to the animal. Um, however, most things that we're going to do with our dogs are going to require, um, some interval of time occurring, you know, between the behavior and the reward. Um, sometimes they won't get rewarded every single time they do a behavior. So we have to prepare for that. And variable reward is kind of the way we do it. And the way I explain it to my students is if, uh, you know, if you were to go, you know, in the hotel to a Coke machine and you put a dollar, a couple dollars in, you would expect every single mm-hmm. time to get mm-hmm. a, a Coke to come out, right? Yep. And uh, if you put a couple dollars in and the Coke didn't come out, uh, you probably wouldn't put any more effort into performing that particular that particular action, and you know because the reward is not forthcoming, right? So, um, for uh, you know for a dog learning how to sit, every time he sits, we give him a piece of food. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna want to repeat that behavior over and over again. But as soon as it the reward doesn't come, the behavior is going to be uh, shut off. In other words, just like you'd walk away from that coat machine, the dog is going to say, "Well, if I'm not going to get rewarded for this, I'm not going to perform anymore." And in order to get that reliability of that performance, we have to we have to sort of switch the rule set on the dog to where it's more of a slot machine than a coke machine, right? And so, you know, if you're standing in front of a, a different type of machine, like a slot machine, you put quarters in, you might be willing to put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, quarters in uh, before you get your payout. And sometimes those payouts can be kind of a jackpot payout. Sometimes it can be uh, steady increasing value payments. But nevertheless, we're willing to perform over and over and over again, you know, i.e. putting money into the into the machine uh, for the expectation, for the hope that we're going to get the payout down the road. And that's kind of what we have to, you know, we have dogs that are outperforming, um, you know, in obedience, for example, I have to go out on an obedience field with no rewards and, and no correction devices on my dog. And he has to do a whole bunch of behaviors in a row from you know, healing around decoys to sit stays and down stays and recalls and retrieves and so forth and so on over a period of, you know, let's say five to, you know, 10 minutes uh, on field time without that dog uh, receiving any kind of reward uh, directly for the behaviors that he's performing. Yet he continues to perform those behaviors and continues to uh, give me very attentive, uh, you know, very, um, you know, very good uh, obedience over that period of time because I've built into his expectation that you don't always receive the reward every single time that you perform a behavior. Sometimes you're going to have to do sequences of behavior in order to receive a reward at the end. And once the dog understands that that's the rule set and that's the way the game is played, you create this hope in the dog that if I don't get it the first time, if I work just a little bit harder, I'll get it the next time. If I don't get it the next time, I'll work it just a little bit harder, push a little bit more, I'll get it the next time. And by uh, introducing variation into that system, we can get a dog to perform behaviors over long intervals, like uh, let's say tracks, for example, with the expectation that if he continues to follow that track, eventually a reward will come. And um, when we're training and so forth for, for that eventuality, like, you know, let's say if in law enforcement, we have to track somebody uh, over a, a lot of different terrain and, uh, you know, maybe hard surface, soft surface, and, you know, maybe difficult terrain up and down hills and so forth, that the dog will keep at it because over the training period, sometimes we rewarded him for just getting into the track. Sometimes we rewarded him after a few minutes on the track. Sometimes he's had to wait until he's almost done. We're almost, uh, let's say, a, a half a mile to a mile to the track before that first reward comes. Um, and we varied it so much that he has the expectation that those rewards can come at any time. And so he keeps pushing uh, because he knows that if he's not gotten it yet, he just works a little bit more, works a little bit longer, works a little bit harder, does one more exercise or not another exercise after that, that that reward will be forthcoming. So that variation builds in kind of what we call hope uh, uh, for the dog that that reward is still coming. It's still coming. And, and that's kind of where we want the dog's mindset. If the dog's always on that mindset of one behavior, one reward, when we get into a situation where he's not going to be rewarded for every single behavior he performs, he's going to treat obedience like the Coke machine and he's going to stop doing it. 
uh, because he's going to think, well, there's nothing in it for me. And changing that rule set on the dog is, is something that has to be in your framework so you understand how to go about doing that in, in obedience and how to bridge from those uh, you know rewards every single time for every single behavior into that variable system so the dog starts to understand that um, if he doesn't get it right away, it's still coming. He's just got to work a little bit more, work a little bit longer, work a little bit harder. Right. Yeah, and I mean, it's something that, you know, like every track that we do is not successful. Right. Um, you know, it's just not. And, you know, we get into the the the, the thing of, you know, uh, we've got into it in the detection side. You know, do you reward the dog when – they searched the area that they're supposed to search, but they didn't find it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I completely follow. And um, <clears throat> so back to the your kind of your philosophy on training with, the, you know, you you talked about the variable ward system and you strength, you know, to break that down, basically, you know, you strengthen that desire because the dog never knows it's coming, but he knows it's coming. Exactly. Right. It's unpre- basically it's the unpredictability of the reward that increases the value of the reward. So, um, you know, when we're, you know, when we're training obedience, for example, you know, no matter what discipline that we're in, our, our goal is at first to, you know, help the dog understand what we want of him. And I think, you know, a lot of times when I see people train dogs, they go right away to, to punishment, um, for not performing when the dog doesn't really know what he's supposed to do in the beginning. Right. So, um, you having some kind of methodology for showing the dog what it is we want him to do, giving him something positive uh, to uh, to look forward to when he does these commands that we want him to perform, uh, and uh, and not sort of teaching him by virtue of you know letting him figure out all the things that he's going to do wrong, and uh, calling attention to those things first in terms of corrections for, you know, that's a wrong behavior, that's a wrong behavior. And then he's got to do all this exploration to figure out, well, what the hell is the right thing to do? Um, Where we teach him, you know, in our system, in our framework, we teach him what the right thing to do is right out of the gate. And then we can start experimenting with, okay, what happens when he decides not to do what we want him to do? And then we have a procedure for introducing what we would call negative reinforcement, which is to ensure the outcome that we want. Like, you know, if I tell him to sit, um, and, uh, and he's inclined not to sit in a particular situation. And I show him that a little bit of upward leash pressure leads to getting his butt on the ground. And then once the butt gets on the ground, he, uh, he, uh, you know, we resolve that leash pressure. We take the leash pressure away. He starts to understand what's going to happen. If I say sit, he decides he's not going to sit. And then I can then progressively kind of make that into what we would call an aversive situation or positive punishment, if you want to talk about it from uh, the standpoint of operant conditioning, where he's going to not do a behavior that I've asked him to do, and then there's going to be a consequence for not doing behavior. I think we have to be careful not to get to that point too quickly, where we think the dog understands what we want of him, but maybe he doesn't really understand. So we're going to use two kinds of reinforcement before we get to any type of positive punishment, that being positive reinforcement to help develop the understanding of the goal directed behavior we're interested in and then negative reinforcement where we're going to start applying some sort of pressure to the dog to ensure the outcome that we want and that would be a leash pressure for a sit command let's say and then you know on top of that leash pressure once the dog actually gets into the command and does the sit for us we're also going to reward them on top of that so we get a little negative reinforcement followed by that positive reinforcement and then we're going to really ensure that he understands that when i say that word we have to get into the behavior and then eventually we get to the point where, you know, we can start applying corrections because he's going to understand that uh, when there's a when he doesn't generate the behavior, when we give him the command, that there's going to be a consequence for that. And the negative reinforcement kind of like builds the sort of builds or sets the stage for us to be able to um, apply that you know, positive punishment or a correction um, in a way the dog is going to understand what has to happen in that situation. Right. <clears throat> so for us, I mean, basic stuff for us is, you know, we want our dogs to lead. Um, we want our dogs to load in the truck. And, you know, I've kind of preached on here that, you know, I do all that with, um, I do all that with food. And I've mm-hmm. posted a few videos. Um, I posted a few videos about it, how I use the food as motivators and, you know, getting the dog to lead and, 
um, like I said, feeding them, you know, feeding them in the truck and giving them an obstacle where they can climb up in the truck when they're younger. Um, mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that's, you know, that's stuff that I use. Um, would you have any thoughts on, you know, kind of on that? What is there something you would add or add to, to what, you know, just those basic, those are very basic skills that we need. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think classifying, you know, what are the, I have a friend who's a police dog trainer and he always, whenever I ask him about training anything, he always says, all right, well, what's the operational state that dog is going to find himself in when he needs to do his job, right? What are, what are the, those operational states, right? And so mm-hmm. based on what we're going to need them to do and, you know, in sort of a hunting scenario um, is going to basically tell us what are the ingredients we need in, you know, sort of the, uh, the process of developing that end state. And so, you know, if we've got to get the dog from the kennel to the truck and load them up and unload them, you know, under control, then for sure we want to teach all, you know, all of those basic things. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, what, you know, I'm assuming when you say lead the dog, you're talking about getting the dog on a leash and, um, you know, managing them on the leash, um, to where we need to go, get them up in the truck, get them in the box, and like all of those things. I think some people take those basics for granted and, um, you know, just assume as a hunting dog, he's going to know to do all those things. And, um, and I think teaching first with food to, you know, sort of lure those behaviors and show them that there's something in it for him when he does the stuff that we want him to do, mm-hmm. uh, is, uh, is definitely something, something I would also do regardless of my, you know, the, the, the goal for my dog, we got to have our police dogs got to get in the trailers. They got to be transported. They got to come out. We've got to be able to put them in crates. We got to be able to take care of them, like put them in the bathtub and wash them and all that kind of stuff. So we need those basic obedience commands to be able to manage the dog's behavior when we're trying to do all sorts of things. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and for us, I mean, we don't need a tight heel like we do, you know, for obedience in the police world or for your right. for your sport. We we just need the dog to walk beside us without, you know, pulling our arms out of socket and mm-hmm. um, doing those type of things. And like I said, I have found that, you know, using food for those things just make it so much more simpler and – you know, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's not, it's not done overnight. And then like you said, mm-hmm. when they decide, okay, the food's not a big enough reward, there has to be some type of, um, adverse effect, <laughs> you know, right. to, to get them to, to, to do what we want to do. But we want to try to keep that in, you know, in the most, the positive manner we can. Right. So I would assume like, for example, like in an operational end state of a, uh, of a, you know, a, a dog that's going to hunt a bear, for example, once the bear gets treed and, you know, you have to do what you have to do. You have to get the dog away from that um, situation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you have to get them back under control. And, uh, you know, if, you're, if your dog doesn't understand a recall in a non-distraction situation, right, where, you know, you've applied whatever cue you want to cue the recall with, whether it's a verbal or a tone or something like that, to where the dog really understands what that, that means out of drive when there, you know, when there isn't a bear in a tree above them. Right. There's really no hope for them understanding you, what you want them to do when they're under that distraction of their, you know, their genetics, which is, you know, they've treated the animal and now they want to, you know, now you want to get them under control, bring them, you know, bring them back on lead and so forth. And, you know, those dogs are not going to really have an understanding of how to do any of that uh, unless we've done it in a low distraction right. situation and out of drive first. And so, you know, so, uh, I think, you know, we talked about earlier before we got on the call that one of the challenges for um, you guys in your line of work is it's, it's kind of a bit of a challenge, maybe a bit difficult to, um, you know, have that animal experience, you know, something akin to a training scenario when where you don't actually have, you know, the the bear and the tree available to you to, to work around or train around, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, so I, I think you know, laying that really good foundation out of drive, out of those situations is going to, you know, just more than anything else going to be essential. Um, you know, because once you do get in those situations and you're going to have to do some training sort of on the job, I would assume when, you know, when the dog gets, you know, something treated and you have to put a long line on the dog and uh, maybe apply a little e-collar pressure to him that you want them to have done that 
many times before in a lower distraction situation, right? To where you can, you know, then apply those tools uh, to where the dog has some understanding of what it is that you want them to do in that case. Um, and, uh, and hopefully maybe provide a reward that, you know, the dog is going to start to understand, uh, which is going to be, okay, if you come away from this, if I can recall you away from it, um, then, uh, and get you back under control, maybe back in the truck after that, that, you know, that there is some way for that dog to understand what you're trying to communicate to him in that particular case. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, of course, and of course that brings up a whole nother, you know, scenario, like, you know, I spend a lot of my off season, you know, we can only hunt, you know, in Virginia, we can hunt August, September, which is our training. And then mm-hmm. December we have it. So we get three months basically. And, you know, Jerry, if, if I'm, you know, I'm blessed because I have a lot of vacation time that I, you know, I take pretty much the month of September and I try to take the month of December off. But mm-hmm. even if you hunt like just like right now, we're getting rain. Um, tomorrow, I mean, today we basically, I mean, didn't do anything because of the rain. And then tomorrow it's supposed to rain. I don't even know if we're going to hunt. Um, Friday's supposed to be a wash. Next Tuesday's a wash. So out of thirty days this month that I can hunt, let's just say that I can. I'm really only in the woods twenty of those days, mm-hmm. and I'm only getting twenty rep. Okay, I'm. I can only get. I can only get twenty repetitions, and I only tree ten bear out of twenty days. So I've got ten repetitions in. Mm-hmm. So I spend the majority of my off season working on exactly what you're saying. And I think this is something that we should really uh, make sure the listeners understand. You can't go into a tree and start applying E if the dog doesn't understand why it's being applied. Exactly. Because yeah. you're just, I think, you're, Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, I think a lot of times what ends up happening is because the dog is already in a high state of drive, uh, immediately most people, especially if they're using e-collars, are going to start applying high levels of stimulation to the dog, um, which in many cases can can cause lots of side effects, one of them being confusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the dog doesn't necessarily know why the stimulation is being applied. Um, it's also very possible that, you know, the aggression that the dogs are showing to the bears and the trees, it would be my assumption, too, that for some of those dogs, that's going to sort of knock them deeper into some more defensive aggression Mm -hmm. um, to where you're actually going to make it. um, Well, let's say you start with like a medium high level on your, on your e-collar and you start stimulating and that just makes the dog a little bit more aggressive toward the bear because he starts to perceive that maybe that bear is the one that's causing him the pain. And so uh, the aggression gets actually, you you can actually negatively reinforce that aggression and staying closer to the tree and the bear Uh um, because the dog starts to assume that that pressure is coming from the bear. And then usually once we realize that, that, um, that stimulation level is not working, we stop tapping the collar and so the dog learns that, well, once the pressure starts, if I just stay here and keep getting more aggressive, um, that's going to turn that stimulation off. So I think, you know, we see this with police dogs all the time, right? Where, you know, you send the dog and, you know, you hit the, hit the e-collar to do the call off and the dog kind of runs through the, the level of stimulation you've chosen. Maybe you went, went really low and um, he starts running through and you don't have any other way to control the animal except you put the e-collar on him. And then the dog runs through and bites a decoy. And then what happens? The handler is like, oh, damn, he, he bit. So he takes the, off the button and the dog is being negatively reinforced to, to bite on the call off. Mm-hmm. And so then the next time you come out, you're like, wow, it's even harder to get this dog <laughs> to turn around, even though I increased the level of stimulation. And what happens is we end up, you know, taking these like really nice genetic specimens of working animals and through progressively, you know, going from lower to higher stimulation levels, you know, we start negatively reinforcing the exact opposite of the behavior we're trying to get. Um, and, that, and we're doing that kind of inadvertently, you know. So I think sometimes when, you know, when people are using e-callers and they're trying to get the dog to recall and they can't. And they start finding that the dog gets stickier and stickier on the thing they're trying to recall them off. They don't realize that they've actually created that bad behavior by the use of the e-collar uh, because they, they actually weren't able to ensure the outcome that they wanted in training. The journey on Houndsman XP has teamed up with one TDC. This dual action support for oral health and mobility in our dogs. This unique supplement is so effective 
that it is recommended by top veterinarian experts worldwide to maintain and improve our dog's health in four different areas. Their oral health, hips, joints, and muscles, skin, coat, energy, and recovery. Guys, I've been using this product for the last six months, and it has been a game changer for me. If you're looking for something to help with the overall health of your dog, go to WorkSoWell.com and give this product a try. It is highly recommended by Houndsman XP here on The Journey. Yes, I don't think people understand that a lot of times it, it drives the dog into that red. Mm-hmm. That Like you said, exactly what you're saying is it has an adverse effect. It does not accomplish what what they want to accomplish. But then again, again, it goes back to foundation. If the dog don't understand why it's being applied, okay, mm-hmm. dad said, come here and right. I'm not coming. It's not because I'm sitting here under a tree, tree, and it's because, you know, dad said, come here and it's, I'm not coming. It's not, it's, you know, the dog has to understand that. And the best time, just what you said, the best time to do that is when you're not hunting under, under low stem conditions and ingrain that into the dog. So, I mean, you have to use less and less and less pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that kind of stuff is really, really important. Um, you know, showing them those pictures that they're going to see kind of in the end state um, in lower drive circumstances so that they can understand what they're being asked to do. And so, you know, really developing those recall foundations under, you know, whatever distractions that you might be able to apply, you know, it might be you know, recalling the dog when there's food opportunities, um, you know, things of that nature where, you know, he can, he can start being in a higher state of drive over a period of time, you know, finding things, let's say short of a bear in a tree where he's going to be invested in the activity and we want to recall him away from that. Right. So like, you know, we'll, we'll do those things with police dogs, for example, if I want to train a call off, I know my dog, let's say likes a ball. So, you know, I might um, start by calling him off his ball, and then when he turns around and comes back toward me, I give him the exact same ball, but it comes from me. And so, you know, I might use a little bit of uh, negative reinforcement to help turn uh, turn him around when he wants to pull toward that ball, and a little bit of leash pressure to bring him back toward me after I've taught it kind of motivationally first mm-hmm. um, uh, with the recall. So I go up in level of stimulation, uh, you know, whatever that attraction or competing motivator is going to be to the recall word that I'm giving him. And then, uh, you know, and then successfully um, uh, reward him with something that he's going to find uh, rewarding. So it might be food. It might be, you know, a, a similar toy or something like that. But we've got to start, you know, got to start successively approximating to um, that high level, high drive situation. And then, like you said, if you get opportunities to, you know, take a young dog and he trees a bear and he's in that situation, you know, put, you know, having the right training tools available to you to where, you know, you can put a leash on him, you can use a little bit of e-stem if he's already been conditioned to it and teach him, okay, you're going to come away from this situation and come back to me now and, and actually ensure the outcome by actually putting the leash on. And I see this happen a lot of times in police work and in sport training where people really over rely on the e-collar. And, you know, one thing we know about e-collars is they're very good at applying force um, you know, we have these handheld units. I, I don't know how many of your listeners are, have been training dogs like I have for 30 years, but you know, back in the old days, the e-collars we had, you know, they had like a damn car antenna on them, and, <laughs> you know, one button and you had to change the plugs on the, you know, on the, on the collar itself. Uh, so yep. you didn't have these nice little, you know, nice little rheostats on your, on your transmitters where you could go from lower to higher and back and forth. So, you know, for us back in back in those days, it really was just a punishing tool for the most part. Like you had to you had to prepare for the worst, you know, which is whatever level you thought that was going to be required to deliver punishment. Nowadays, we can use negative reinforcement. We can use low levels. We can work our way to where we're going to have a working level for that dog that he's going to respect, but also not something that's going to push him too far into, you know, into, into, let's say, a defensive state where he's, he's going to be fighting against the stimulation and thinking that he's being successful by fighting it. And we can also put leashes on the dogs, right? So, you know, I just did two PSA seminars on the West Coast, and one of the things I got on some of the younger handlers about was, you know, you can't always rely on the e-collar. You know, sometimes you know, a, uh, a leash makes a big difference. So I can now introduce not just force to the dog, but direction, mm-hmm. right? So if I want him to come away from something, 
um, I can apply stimulation and then show him with the leash and overlaying those two tools to actually show him what I want. And then when he does what I want and he comes to me, you know, may, maybe I've got like a very, you know, very nice, uh, you know, food reward for him or something like that. So I can start actually teaching him that, you know, this is, you know, this is the result of proper behavior in this situation. And I don't allow him to make the mistake of fighting through it and not coming away from it and so forth. I can, I can guide him as well as pressure him. Uh, and I, I think when we, when we think about what we're doing, uh, and have that framework to, to rely on and say, okay, you know, I want to make sure that I'm communicating effectively with the dog, you know, like all these tools that we have, whether it's leashes or e-collars or whatever, food rewards are all ways in which we can, you know, sort of operantly, uh, you know, in, a, in an operant conditioning setting, um, you know, be able to communicate effectively with this dog about the consequences that the world is applying to him. And those consequences are the things that we're applying, you know, both, you know, negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement, punishment, that kind of stuff. The dog has to understand um, how to behave in the circumstances of those consequences that are, are being applied to them. Yeah. So something else I kind of want to pick your brain about, um, because I run into this a lot. Um, some guys don't care. For me, it's very annoying. Um, my dog box is built where I can shut it off and I want my dogs to be quiet in there. Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. my dogs are barking in the box, it's because they just cross. I mean, we just drove across a scorching hot track, which means the bear just crossed and they're, you know, they're exploding in the box. Mm -hmm. But I see this, it's very common that, you know, people have a dog and once they have one dog, then they've got five dogs that are barking in the box. Um, and I would kind of take that, you know, kind of equate that to maybe you have a dog, it's in a crate, um, out on the training field and the dog knows he's getting ready to go to work and he gets excited. And how do we, how do we contain that? Or what are some methods or training things that we can do to help, um, curve that behavior, if not eliminate it altogether, if that's what we choose to do? Mm. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one, right? Because you have, um, you know, a lot of times what happens is, you know, we have those dogs, they get excited because they're, you know, it's all about anticipation, right? So mm -hmm. for us, you know, for us in the sport dog world, you know, I go to my club and I've got my dog and crates in the back of the car and I show up at club. And as soon as I hit that gravel road where he, it makes that familiar sound and, and he starts mm -hmm. getting close to where he knows he's going, right, then you start to get the, the behavior, which is the anticipation starts boiling over a little bit. You know, dog wants to start barking and that kind of stuff in anticipation of the work. And, um, you know, for some people, that's a that's a it's a big deal. It's a pet peeve. They don't want their dogs going going ballistic uh, in anticipation of what they're going to do. And I mean, one reason for that is because it'll, it really will tire the dog out, um, you know, depending on how long it's going to take before that dog is going to come out and do his work for us. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and I think I think sometimes what ends up happening is you know, we get there and let's say the dog is barking and you go around to the back and the next thing you know, you release him and he starts thinking, well, that barking, you know, was the thing that happened right before I got out of the box. Yep. And then, you know, and then, so, you know, there's this chain of anticipation that happens, you know, then the next time the dog comes to the, to the club, he's thinking, if I start barking right now, that's going to bring him out of the car and he's going to open up the box and bring me out and we're going to go on the field and we're going to do some biting. And so, you know, you start to condition that anticipation and one thing in the dog's mind connects to the next, which is the excitement and the barking, you know, precedes the letting out of the box, which precedes going out on the field and doing the thing that I want to do, which is bite. So, you know, one, you know, one thing that we would have to think about is, you know, making sure that, um, you know, when that, you know, when that dog is quiet, that's when he's going to get out of the box. Um, you know, it's just like having a raising a puppy in the house and, mm -hmm. you know, if they whine or, or, or bark or something like that, and then you, you go to them to see what's going on you let them out, they're going to start thinking, well, whining or barking is going to let me out of the box and I can do what I want. So I'll continue with that behavior. So I think we have to be real careful about, um, you know, the timing of those sorts of things. Now, you know, for, depending on the dog, I think, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a, a few different things that you can do. Like, again, 
you know, pun, you know, consequences matter in these situations. So if I definitely want my dogs quiet, I have to have some way to ensure that I can shut that barking off when it first starts. And for, you know, for many people that could be putting the dog on a bark collar or something like that, you know, as you're, uh, you know, coming to the field so that if the dog does start with that, you know, sort of, uh, um, barking in anticipation of getting out and so forth, we can kind of curb it fairly quickly. And, and then we have to be really careful about letting the dog out and immediately going into the behavior that they want, like some sort of intermediate behavior has to happen. So for us, a lot of times it's, you know, I'll, um, you know, I'll let my dog out of the crate when he's quiet and then, um, put him on a leash. He gets to go potty a little bit and then, you know, I'll start doing a little bit of obedience before I take him out on the field. Um, the obedience is meant to sort of be an intermediate behavior between that and maybe go on the field and biting. Um, you know, so he's not just, you know, getting on the leash and coming out and, and, and thinking that right away he can, you know, he can start going bananas in the parking lot even before I ever take him out on the field where he's going to see the decoy. So we have to be real cognizant of the chain of events that leads to the thing that's going to be really rewarding to the dog. Um, now, you know, the question then becomes like, how willing are people to work on some of those intermediate behaviors to, you know, take that dog's energy, channel it into something else like healing or obedience or downstays or something like that. What do you, you know, what are some of the things that you do to, uh, to try and curb some of that barking behavior? I'm kind of curious to see what your, you know, sort of what your training, you know, situation or layout is for, for that. Well, I mean, it is not, and it goes back to my you know, law enforcement side, I started at a very young age and, um, whether the dog's in the kennel or the crate, the kennel being the outside kennel, um, if they're barking and carrying on and acting a fool, they don't come out. I'll step inside the kennel and I will stand there until they, they calm down. And once they calm down, Mm -hmm. um, then I will slowly open the door and release them. Uh, but, Mm -hmm. but I start that at a very, very young age. You have to, um, and yes, and I, so I transferred <laughs> over to the to the dog box, and it's so funny that you said when you hit that gravel road, because I have had dogs, Jerry, over the last you know I've been doing this twenty seven years in, in the hound side, and I've had dogs that as soon as you turn off the hard top and you hit that dirt road, they know, <laughs> and they start that yeah. whimpering and whining and you know going through the same thing you just said. They they know that this is what's coming. So what I have started doing is in the dog box, I'll open the box and I do the same thing. I don't let them out. Mm -hmm. I make them stay. Um, And then when they come out, I don't let them run a fool. So I'll put them on the lead, just like exactly what Mm -hmm. you're saying. Now I don't, I'm not necessarily doing obedience because we're in the the hunting side of it. And once they're Mm -hmm. on the lead, they're kind of looking at me. All right, dad, what are we doing? What are we doing? Right. Um, but again, it all goes back to that foundation. And I mean, I, I mean, knock on wood, I've had dog that bark in the box. Don't get me wrong. But once I started switching that at the kennel or the crate, right. my problems pretty much went away from the truck. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think, yeah, it does. Because, um, you know, like what we, what we start teaching the dog when we do things like that is that, uh, in those situations, calmness is what brings a reward rather than mm-hmm. what traditionally works is excitement, right? When the dog gets excited and we, you know, we're, we go to the kennel, we let him out. Then he thinks that it's that excitement. The barking is actually, you know, triggering us to open the door and let them out. Yep. And so when the dogs think that, then they're just going to keep repeating that behavior because it works, even though it's just completely coincidental, Right. If you don't care about barking and you go there and your dog's going bananas and you open up the door and he runs out, he, your dog, your dog still thinks his barking made the door open. You're reinforcing that behavior. Uh, You're reinforcing that behavior. You know, the, uh, we call that in in obedience training, the pre-MAC principle, right? We, we reinforce one behavior in this case, the barking by giving the dog another behavior to engage in, which is running to the truck. 
right? So, mm-hmm. you know, so that to the dog is inherently exciting. He gets out of confinement. He gets to run around, right? He gets to run to the truck, which he knows transports into all the fun. Right. And so, you know, we see that all, we see that all the time with, with all kinds of dogs where, you know, the, you know, even pet dog training, it happens all the time, right? Where the, you know, the owners have a dog that's like jumping all over the front door because they're about to let him out to the backyard mm-hmm. and, you know, and they're scratching and, and, and they quickly open the door because they don't want their door scratched up and uh, they let him out in the backyard and they don't realize that they're just, you know, they're just reinforcing that crazy behavior at the door. And then, you know, a pet dog trainer would tell them, well, what we're going to do is we're going to tell them to sit and we're going to wait for them to be calm. And we're going to enforce that calmness maybe with the leash and the collar first for a little while. And then when they're calm, we let them outside. So the dog starts to think, okay, well, calmness, sitting, being, you know, sort of patiently waiting for, for a dad to open the door, that's what's going to bring the reward of the freedom and being able to run around outside. So we're, we're using that pre-MAC principle in, this, in that case to reward calmness and reward being contained. And then we, you know, we, we treat that scratching at the back door by, you know, by what we call a mutually exclusive behavior. They can't sit all four feet on the ground and scratch the door simultaneously. So we mm-hmm. introduce that command sort of as a bridge to help us, you know, get the dog to stop scratching. But, you know, same thing you're talking about. Now I'll tell you what the problem is, what you're with, what you're doing is it takes patience. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. And I think yeah. we skip through. And I, I mean, I, like I said, I say this all the time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Don't expect yeah. immediate results. This is a process. Yeah. And I think I would, I would assume that a lot of your listeners are starting with puppies and, and they're shaping those behaviors from, mm-hmm. from, from youth, right? Uh, when those puppies are young dogs. And that's really where it's easiest to shape these behaviors. Um, you know, once you, you know, if you were to buy an older dog, I would assume that's already hunted, uh, and had years of experience going bananas in the box, then you're probably going to have a really hard time changing that dog's mind about whether or not it's the excitement that gets them out or, or being calm. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, but when you're starting with these young dogs and you're starting with puppies, if you take the time at the beginning, like you said, at the outset of this podcast, to lay the foundation of behaviors you expect and you have a framework of how to progress through that so you can continue to teach that dog those behaviors. You know, the other nice thing is if you're working with young dogs, you know, especially if you're bringing a new dog in and you've already got dogs that you've taught these things to, the dog will learn from the other dogs that it's not mm-hmm. the bananas in the box that gets you out, it's being quiet. And so they start to, you know, we, you know, we call that, uh, a Lilo mimetic behavior, like mimicry behavior. Right. And they'll learn, you know, that puppy might think, Oh, I'm in the box. I'm contained. You know, I want to get out. And he starts barking and he sees all these other dogs being quiet. And he starts to realize, well, maybe, maybe I should shut up and maybe that's going to get me out of the box. And after some repetitions of that, yeah, it gets you out of the kennel. It gets you out of the box get you to do what you want to do. Uh, but you do have to have patience for that kind of stuff. It's, you know, when you have these type of high drive dogs, sometimes it's, you know, they, they're, they're much better at waiting you out than you are at waiting them out. <laughs> yes. That's, I mean, that's so true. Um, I mean, I mean, and, and it takes, you know, sometimes it takes a dog wired a little differently to do what we're asking. We, you know, we're asking them to go out here and catch a two, three, 400 pound animal. Um, right. you know, so it does take a little bit of that, um, that drive to do that. Uh, but I have found I would prefer to raise a pup because I've found that I can shape it into what I want. And mm-hmm. to elaborate on what you just said, uh, in fact, one of my buddies is in and we were hunting and I'm, I've got some young dogs. I got a two year old and a couple 18, 19 months old. And I had them on a, uh, we have a, we have, I have a triple coupler so I can hook three dogs together by this says mm-hmm. you know system and i don't have to put a lead on and i was explaining to him yesterday that if you get one dog that'll do it they'll train the next dog and then you have two dogs right. that'll do it and then you can train the next dog and you put right. very little effort into doing it because they learn so much from each other yes very true <clears throat> so i mean i use that in my benefit a lot um and like i said i feel like because i don't have a yapper in my box um, I, that's not a problem, but I have seen that if you have one, then your whole box is doing it before it's over said and, <laughs> said and done. If you don't correct it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
So Jerry, is there anything um, else that you think that you could add? I mean, I know we, you know, we kind of just hitting the high spots with the foundation, um, you know, with kind of, you know, cap dri- driving, capping that drive that, mm-hmm. that we talked about the tree. And again, um, I feel like, again, it all goes back to your found, your work when you're the off season and, yeah. you know, you, you know, I, and I say this all the time, <clears throat> You know, you you do this you do this for a living. You're working dogs six and seven days a week. Um, most of our guys that hunt, they they spend less time with their dogs in the off season because you know they're working, family, you know mm-hmm. X, Y, and Z. And I remember one thing that you said in one of your podcasts, or maybe it was in a class that you said that if the police field would spend as much time with their dogs as the the sport guys, their dogs would be 10 times better. No, for sure. And when you said that, I'm like, huh. And then I started paying attention and listening and watching and the sport dog guys do. I mean, it's their life. Um, Uh You know, for me, you know, that dog's with me 12 hours, two days or three days in a row. And then he goes up for a couple of days and then I go to training on Monday and then he works with me a couple of days. And then I, you know, so, <clears throat> you know, I train 16 hours a month, which we all know is not enough. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think one of the, the things that affect us as hunters is not spending the quality amount of time with those dogs. It, it's, you know, you can get, a, I, I, and you tell me what you think. I feel like as the older the dog gets, you can, you can get away from that a little bit. But when that dog's young and his first year and two years of life, that that's when the, it's most impressionable. Not that mm-hmm. you can't change behaviors later on, because we all know you can. But like you said just a minute ago, it's 10 times harder to do that. Sure. Um, and I feel like when you said, you know, patience and it takes time that, you know, I, I've got my dogs out three months a year. And then the other nine months a year, they're basically in the kennel doing nothing, which I try very hard not to let that happen. I have my dogs yeah. out. I'll take them riding. You know, I'll, I, my young dogs, I'll have them up in the truck when I go to the garbage dump. You know, when I'm running to tractor supply or whatever, I take them with me just just to spend 30 minutes sure. of time with them. Well, I, th- I think, you know, uh, at, at the end of the day for me, you know, I'm busy. I'm training police dogs all day, uh, doing seven hours travel and that kind of stuff. So I kind of when, when I'm actively competing a dog, for example, I try and set a goal of doing something with that dog every day. Now, it might be some conditioning work, you know, where I, you know, go to either put them on a, a slap mill or I take them to a hill and throw the ball up the hill and do hill sprints with them for mm-hmm. 15 or, or 20 minutes. Uh, I might take them out and just work on some fundamentals, um, you know, healing of attention work and left turns and right turns and about turns and change of pace and things like that. You know, but a lot of times those training sessions, you know, aside from, you know, like you would say, your your you know, um, uh, scheduled, uh, departmental training sessions. A lot of times my, you know, I've got my two club days a week, you know, that we go to and we spend time there, but, you know, I'm looking at, you know, on the off days when I'm not actually with everybody doing training, I'm thinking about spending 15 to 20 minutes with that dog doing something important and productive. And if you spend, you know, that amount of time working on, you know, things like recalls with your dog, um, just in different circumstances, take them different places, you just sort of generalize that behavior to, you know, different distances and things of that nature. Um, I think you'd be doing yourself a really big service. And and I think a lot of people think, well, when I got to go to training, it's got to be hours long. And, Mm -hmm. and in fact, you can really get a lot done in 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, when you, uh, kind of like say, okay, this is what, this is my goal this session. I just want to work on this one thing. You know, maybe tomorrow I don't have as much time as I did today, so I'm just going to do 15 minutes of, you know, conditioning work with my dog. And then the next day I'm going to work on this other fundamental, um, you know, I think you can get a lot done. And, and, you know, you'd be a surprise in a year, you know, if you, you know, you get, you know, you could, you could do probably 300 training sessions, uh, you know, in, in a year. And you just focus on, I want to do one thing with my dog every day. Right. Yeah, I and I mean, I just you know, kind of reiterate what you're saying. You know, I've got three nine month old puppies, and I've got a six month old pup. And at four months old, and and it, they're, again, they're not police dogs, but I've got we've got this six month old pup 
we we do a lot of those training sessions while we're feeding. We use food yeah. to do that much. So I'm having my dog sit and down. Now, do I need mm-hmm. to, do I need to have a hound down? There's no purpose for my hound to ever down. He don't have to. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to teach him patience and calmness. And when I bring him to the bo- the truck and we do that, I've already got that accomplished because like you said, he right. can't do everything else if he's performing a different task for me. Exactly. And then think about this too. I think, you know, you're also teaching that dog how to learn. So even though those behaviors might not be directly beneficial in, on a hunt, right. In those young, uh, those young months of, of that dog's life, you're teaching him how to learn things. You're teaching him, you're going through that, you know, that process of lure and reward and mm-hmm. some negative reinforcement and, and so forth and so on, getting us through that progression of how to learn things so that, you know, when it becomes more imperative when you're doing things that he's going to have to do on a hunt, that he already understands how to learn things, right? I think like, we don't pay enough attention to just worrying about teaching the dog how to learn. Um, and, it, you know, those behaviors don't have to be directly uh, useful in a particular uh, situation. But, you know, having had gone through that, the dog is richer for having learned that, that learning process so that when you do apply it in context, that's going to matter to him. He already knows how to learn new things. And so teaching him those things that are essential in those circumstances are going to be easier. And, and I, I think it, it is less stressful on the dog. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I think then he's, he's learned, he's learned how to, he's learned how to take cues. He's learned how to process information, uh, process, uh, rewards. He's learned how to process, um, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, all those sorts of things, uh, mm-hmm. take practice. Yeah. And I mean, I've already had the, um, I've already had E on him. Um, I, I, I mean, I very rarely even have to use it. Um, mm-hmm. he's, he's super gamey. Um, so it means that right. he will chase anything that moves. Prey drive is high. Right, <laughs> and right. my neighbors have goats and, and horses, and my other neighbor has cow. I live right in a farming community. Uh-huh. And he, I mean, at four months old, he was getting after him. Um, mm-hmm. and I mean, getting after him. So I had to break <laughs> that behavior because I can't have him sure. breaking my neighbor's horse's leg. Right, so, right. <laughs> you know, I started applying very little E, um, and now – Literally, I, I I mean I don't I just have to say tell him no, like the mm-hmm. pressures went ple- completely away. So he learned ten times faster at four months old than he would at two years old. Sure, sure. <clears throat> so anyway, well Jerry, we'll wrap this up. And like I said, I can't thank you enough. I mean, like I said, some of your information is invaluable. Like I said, I still listen to your podcast. Uh, you know the the two part I told you earlier the two part series you've done on aggression. Uh, for me, was phenomenal because we have, you know, we we ask our dogs to catch a big game animal, and some of our dogs uh-huh. are a little bit um, more aggressive. Like you said, they they hit that high state, and their their prey is over the top, and you know they'll get yally at each other and stuff. So I try to incorporate a lot of stuff right. that, that you, you, you've told me, or you said, you know, you've t- told on your podcast, and I mean, so I appreciate it. Is there anything that you want to leave us with? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, I think honestly, you know, every group of dog trainers I get in front of, you know, just, you know, you know, thinking about, um, you know, the best dog trainers I know are the ones that are obsessed with fundamentals, with the basics, with always going back to those things. You know, I, I brought up to the seminar I was doing this weekend. I said, if you go to, you know, let's say a professional football team and watch them practice, for example, you see those wide receivers out there just catching thousands of passes, catch two steps in, you know, out of bounds. And they do that over and over and over and over again until that muscle memory is just so clean and clear. And I think oftentimes when we're training dogs, we want to be thinking about those same things, you know, work on those essential behaviors, um, you know, practice them as much as you can, you know, take every opportunity that you can to, to approximate those behaviors so that, you know, when you do get out to a real situation, you know, your fundamentals are strong, uh, and, and you're not, you're not wishing you had spent more time in the laboratory as it were. Yeah. Well, and I try to teach, I try to think that everything that I do is a training session, like mm-hmm. everything for me with my hound or, or my dogs in general is a learning session. You know, sure. what, what can I improve on? What, what? what method or philosophy can I use to make it better? 
Um, and one thing that I've learned, and I'm nowhere near the, the, the scholar you are, but you can never quit learning. Like you have, oh, to, you have to have an open mind and be willing to try different things because mm-hmm. there's always a different way that may work better than the one that you've used previously or you're using now. Oh, hundred percent. I think that's for me as a, a dog trainer, I'm a dog trainer, but I would say first I'm a student of dog training. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I always, you know, whenever I travel or I, I watch other people work dogs, there's always something useful. There's always something I can take away from it. There's always something that stimulates how I'm thinking about what I'm doing. Um, and, and that's what really makes it fun, you know, to, uh, to evolve over a period of time, to try different things. And sometimes you try things that don't work out very well, but you know, sometimes you learn a lot, you know, it, learning what not to do is also a good thing. Yes. <laughs> right? Learning from your mistakes, your mistakes is the best teacher. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. You want to avoid those things. <clears throat> yeah. I appreciate you having me on. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun to talk about a topic that's uh, a little outside my area of expertise for sure. But, uh, I do, I do appreciate you bringing me on, and I'm glad I could, glad I could be with you tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jerry, we end every uh, podcast with thank you for helping us teach, train, and learn.